Thank you all for coming. We are going to um, change it up a little bit. You all are used to us uh, presenting um, some rather lengthy uh, legal and tax analysis and some long outlines. And uh, we're going to talk about those concepts, but we're planning today to do them just a little bit differently. We're going to do them in the backdrop of some TV shows. Um, and, uh, and, and do PowerPoint. Um, uh, uh, we came up with some TV shows or current circumstances that <clears throat> fit the category of what it is that we wanted to talk about, and we hope this is maybe just a little bit more entertaining. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today are tax consequences of trust and estate settlements and modifications. Uh, we have, you know, we've all run into circumstances where there have either been will contests or trust contests or uh, after someone dies, there have been conflicts with trust or we end up with trust that we don't like the provisions of and what can we do about those and how can we do them in a tax effective manner. And so we're going to give you four scenarios today. These scenarios, although we've, we've couched them in terms of some, some uh, TV shows, are all circumstances that we have dealt with in our practice. These all come from current ca or case studies of ours. Um, and uh, the names obviously have been changed to reflect um, the TV programs. Uh, and um, but the we hope to illustrate uh, four different methods or techniques of dealing with problems in contests or trusts that we hope can uh, help you all deal with your circumstances in, with clients where it these kinds of things may come up because they come up all the time. Um, I think you know all of us, but uh, let me introduce David Akins. I'm Lauren Dutzel. This is Matt Ahern, and this is Brian Malik. And we're going to each take one of these scenarios and uh, set up the fact circumstance and then walk you through how you can fix it uh, and what the tax minefields are that you have to walk your way through in order to be able to fix it. And then at the end, we want to have, if we have a few minutes, there were a few developments in this latest legislative session that we think are important. And there are three things that we wanted to just highlight for you that happened in the legislature. And we will uh, go over those at the end. So without further ado, Brian is going to start us off with um, and this is, as he told me, you know, this is a different generation. He's a completely different generation from me. Uh, that he grew up with the fresh, wait a minute, what is it? The Fresh Prince, fresh of, Bel Prince of Bel Air. Yeah. So <laughs> take it away, Brian. Okay, so the uh, first scenario we're going to go through is kind of a typical scenario that we see a lot of times. It's a credit shelter trust where the entire family is not necessarily getting along, uh, which we see all too often for sure. So just going through the case study first and uh, setting the facts forth. But um, first we have Uncle Phil, and he dies survived by his wife Vivian, his son Carlton, and his adopted son Will. Uh, Phil leaves a credit shelter trust, provides for discretionary distributions for health, education, maintenance, and support, which is language we typically use in trusts uh, like this. And also upon Vivian's death provides that it's going to split into separate dynasty trusts for Carlton and Will. So assume the credit shelter trust gets a total of five million of assets. The first million is securities. You have two million of rental properties. And then of course there's a $2 million interest in a family dance studio business um, that Carlton is now in charge of and manages. And of course, Carlton being the gifted businessman and dancer that he is, he expects the value of the business to grow over the next five years now that he's in charge and can teach whatever he wants to teach. And for those of you who have seen this show before, you know, no presentation would be complete without this for Carlton. <laughs> okay. So Carlton hates the idea that basically his labor into the business is going to go ahead and benefit Will and his descendants after mom's passed away. Because after all, Will's share of the Credit Shelter Trust is 50%. So whatever the assets are at Vivian's death, Will's going to get 50% of those. Of course, Will thinks Carlton is a disaster and he wants nothing to do with the business. Upon Vivian's death, there's a sure to be a fight between Will and Carlton uh, regarding the division of the trust assets and primarily, uh, as is often the case with family businesses, valuation is, is likely to be a dispute. 
for the business. However, while mom's still alive, kids tend to cooperate. And in this situation, of course, Will and Carlton will pay attention to what Vivian has to say regarding uh, any compromises that need to be reached. So what can be done to save the Banks family? So as I mentioned, this is kind of a common situation we come up, we come across, and uh, it's common because it, you know, usually you have one CEO or head of the family who's generated the wealth for the family. And in this case, we've just used Phil, and the, uh, the dad. Uh, leaves assets and trust for mom. Of course, when dad was alive, he was in charge. He made all the rules, so everybody went along with it. But now that dad's passed away, the kids can get a sniff of the inheritance and you know, conflicts start to develop. Uh, so, proposed solution that uh, this is kind of a um, how-to guide for a situation like this and involves the severance and a modification of the credit shelter trust. And it's basically two steps. The first one being the severance of the trust, which is dividing the big credit trust into two separate trusts. So we're going to have one trust set up for Vivian for the benefit of Will and a second trust set up for Vivian and the benefit of Carlton and his descendants. Trust one, which would be Will's trust, will own uh, $2 million of rental properties and 500000 of securities. Trust two for Carlton uh, will own the family business interest and enough securities, which in this case is 500000 to make the trust equal in value currently. Basically, the remaining terms of the trust are identical. The only thing you switch is you take out Carlton from Will's credit shelter trust and take out Will from Carlton's Credit Shelter Trust. Now, what does this get us doing the severance and modification? Well, you start off, each trust has assets worth $2.5 million. Um, second, only Vivian, Carlton, and Carlton's descendants are going to uh, share in the success or the failure of the business. So basically, to the extent that Carlton increases the value of the business while Vivian's still alive, that 100% of that appreciation is going to go to benefit uh, his credit shelter trust. None of that is going to go to benefit Will's credit shelter trust. Another benefit, each trust has its own assets. So with respect to Will's credit shelter trust, he and Vivian can get together and agree on the investments. You know, those investments may not be suited for Carlton. So he doesn't have to worry about going to get Carlton's consent uh, for the investment of those assets. And of course, we need to make sure that Vivian's still taken care of because she is still in the picture. And uh, one thing we do in this situation when we split it into two trusts is make sure that any distributions that are made to the spouse come equally from both children's trust so that one trust does not bear the burden of providing for Vivian during her lifetime while the other one doesn't provide anything. Um, the other big benefit of this is that you value the business right now while Vivian's still alive. Uh, we have found that while there's a parent still alive, the likelihood that the kids are going to compromise is much greater than if you're trying to sort this out after uh, one of the parents has passed away. So under state law, we have uh, got to look at what are the options to accomplish the severance and modification. And luckily in Florida, we have a, a statute specifically on point in case the authority is not in the trust document itself. But basically under 736 -0417, it says you can sever a trust into multiple trusts as long as it does not impair the rights of any beneficiary. And here, you know, the severance into the two trusts we do not think would impair the rights of any beneficiary. Um, basically, each beneficiary is getting what they want in this situation, which is, you know, Will's getting out of the business and Carlton's getting the business at the end of the day. Um, as far as your modification options go, Florida has a whole host of modification options under Chapter 736 of Florida Trust Code, uh, some of the ones that may apply in this situation. So we have the, the non-judicial modification options. We have uh, one under 736.0412, which basically provides that upon the unanimous agreement of the trustee and all the qualified beneficiaries, uh, the terms of the trust can be modified. There are some limitations on this. Uh, basically, it only applies to trust created after December 31st, 2000, and the trust must also state that it shall extend for the maximum period allowed under Florida law. There was a change in 2001 where it used to be a Florida trust could only go to the longer of 90 years or 21 years, I'm sorry, could only extend to 90 years after the date of creation or 21 years after a life and being. 
that was changed in 2001 to provide up to 360 year maximum term for trust. Uh, so that's kind of where that magic date comes into play. Uh, but as long as you have the 360 year provision in your trust, you can use 736.0412. Uh, the next option would be a, a decanting option. And this is something that gets a lot of press. I'm not going to go into this, but Lauren will talk about this in her scenario in a minute. Moving on to the judicial modification options. Um, we have a couple under floor law as well, 736.04113, which basically says because of changed circumstances, um, you basically you apply to the court and say, hey, we've had changed circumstances that were not anticipated by the set law. If we continue to comply with the terms of the trust, then we feel like it's going to impair a material purpose of the trust. So in this situation, certainly an argument could be made that if we don't resolve this conflict right now, then there's the potential that uh, the settlor's purpose of preserving the trust assets could be impaired through future litigation or fights between the, the beneficiaries after Vivian's gone. Um, 736.04115, modification for best interests. This again is basically a, a petition to the court that says um, if we continue to comply with the terms of the trust, that is not in the best interest of the beneficiaries. So certainly an argument in this situation would be, um, you know, it's in the best interest of the beneficiaries that we resolve this potential for litigation uh, because it's going to create costs and fights in the future. There are some limitations on when you can use the best interest standard, but I won't get into those uh, for time. So basically we have four modification options under state law. Second state law issue we have to worry about is funding these trusts. And if you remember, I said at the beginning, um, we're going to put the $2 million of rental properties and 500000 of securities into Carlton's trust, or I'm sorry, into Will's trust. And then we're going to put the $2 million business interest and 500000 of securities into Carlton's trust. And so the question is, well, can you pick and choose your assets, or do you have to initially start off with each trust owning a proportionate share of each interest? And the general rule is that you have to fund pro rata unless you have uh, authority under state law or under the terms of the trust. So if you don't have authority for what we call non pro rata funding, meaning pick and choose your assets where they go, then uh, you can always look to uh, let's see, 736.0816 subsection 22, which under Florida law gives you the right to fund non pro rata. Um, Next state law issue we're concerned about always is trustee liability. A lot of times when we're doing these modifications, we're representing the trustee. So we're always trying to do what we can to make sure they are protected. Uh, and the way we do that is we try to get all the beneficiaries to consent, all the potential beneficiaries who have claims, who may have a claim against the trustee. We want to get them to consent to this modification. If they can't, then we'll go to get court approval so that the court signs off on this as something that the trustee can do. Uh, this works great if you have adult beneficiaries who have a legal capacity to sign documents, but if you have minors involved, then it may not be so easy. Now, Florida has a concept called virtual representation, which basically says minors can be represented by parents or by a beneficiary who has, has a substantially identical interest in the trust. And um, to the extent there's no conflict of interest. So as long as there's no conflict of interest, we're good and getting them to uh, sign. So turning now, those are the state law issues. Now we gotta look at the tax consequences. We're always concerned about what are the income gift to state and GST tax consequences whenever we're doing these modifications or restructuring trusts. And starting off with the income tax issues, remember I said that there's two parts to this. The first one being the severance, uh, meaning the split of the trust into two trusts. And there is authority under the tax regulations that says basically the severance will not be a taxable event to the extent um, it's permitted by the trust or state statute or, or and also, I'm sorry, and also that the non pro rata funding is authorized by state law. So in Florida, we have both of those situations. So this is a severance that can be done without taxable uh, consequences. Looking at the modification step now, there's a landmark case out there called Cottage Savings v. Commissioner. And this is a 1991 Supreme Court case it's been cited in numerous PLRs dealing with trust modifications. But basically in that situation, the funny thing is, is that this is not even a trust case. It's just a exchange of mortgages between a savings associations. So in that case, you said, look at what 
uh, one party has before the transaction and look at what they have after the transaction. And if you have um, legally distinct entitlements to property in those two situations, then you have a taxable disposition. And the actual language that really comes out of this test is that it says an exchange of interest results in a disposition only if the interests are materially different in kind or extent. So what we're looking at in these situations is, you know, does the beneficial interest in the trust before the modification, is that materially different in kind or extent to the beneficial interest of the beneficiaries after the modification? Uh, to the extent that it's, it's not uh, illegally distinct entitlements there, then we're good and it's not a taxable disposition. Turning to the gift tax issues for a minute, um, our concern here is that Carlton is relinquishing his interest in Will's trust and Will is relinquishing his interest in Carlton's trust. So have they shifted value between them where one is considered to be making a gift to the other? And again, this is a comparison of before the modification and after the modification. Um, you know, here, if we look at what did Carlton have an interest in before the modification, he was a discretionary benefit or he was a remainder beneficiary in a trust that was entitled to 50% of the value of the credit trust assets. So after the modification, what does he have? He has a, a remainder interest in a trust that's received 50% of the credit trust assets. So the thought being that his interest after the modification is worth the same amount. He might not have, his trust might not have the same assets as the credit shelter trust had before, but at the end of the day, he has the same value. So therefore it should not be a gift. And if there's a, any litigation around this, Matt's gonna get into the rules about avoiding the gift tax consequences uh, when you have litigation, regardless of how the uh, beneficial interests are shifted between the beneficiaries. Lastly, the GST tax issue, sometimes these get overlooked. Um, but the current concern here is that the credit shelter trust upon Phil's death was something that was, you know, was allocated GST exemption so that it was exempt for up to 360 years in Florida. We wanna make sure that in these two resulting trusts we've created, that that GST exemption is preserved. And so what we're gonna look at is first the severance. There are qualified, there are rules under the IRS treasury regulations that basically says you can sever a trust and not have adverse GST tax consequences as long as you meet certain requirements. And those requirements are up here. Basically that the severance was pursuant to state law or the trust terms. It was effective under local law, which we have both of those under Florida law. The funding must occur within 90 days of the severance. The original trust is severed on a fractional basis, meaning the trust is severed. 50% of the assets go to one trust, 50% go to the other. It cannot be severed on a pecuniary basis, meaning we can't put 300,000 worth of assets in one trust and the balance of the assets in another trust. We always want to make sure that it's fractional so that each trust uh, receives a proportionate share of value. And lastly, the resulting trust must provide for the same succession of interest to beneficiaries, which in this situation, we're keeping the beneficial interest the same uh, throughout each generation. Moving on to the modification, the GST issues. Again, you have regulations under the tax code under 2601, basically says the modification is not going to hurt the GST uh, status of the trust as long as it does not shift a beneficial interest to a lower generation than those who held an interest prior to the modification. So the, an example of a shift in interest would be adding a lower generation that's not a current beneficiary of the trust before the modification. And the second requirement is that uh, the modification may not extend the time for vesting of any beneficial interest beyond the period provided for in the original trust. And you'll remember at the beginning I said, you can have a 360 year trust in Florida the old rule was a 90 year trust. So if you're dealing with an, an older trust being a trust that can only last for 90 years, you cannot, as a result of the modification, make it a 360 year trust. That would be a situation where you're extending the time for vesting uh, in that. So ultimately what that gives us is, you know, we've, got, we've saved the bank's family. Carlton has control of his dance studio that he can now, you know, focus on for growing the business. And we've done all this without adverse tax consequences, and the family fight has hopefully been uh, resolved, at least for a while. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David to talk about Q-tip trust and issues dealing with those modifications.
Okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, settlements and guarding, regarding Q-tip trusts, and these are a little slightly different than what Brian was talking about. Well, they're very different, but he was talking about dividing trusts. I guess I'd look at it down the middle. In other words, splitting them into you know the current interest and the remainder interests uh, down the middle into two separate trusts. I'm going to be talking about splitting trusts. I think I would sort of this way into life interests and remainder interests. Um, and, and so before I get into my uh, case study number two here, I just briefly want to, and hopefully I won't run over my time, I'll keep track of myself here. By way of history, uh, before 1982, you couldn't leave property in a trust and have it qualify for the marital deduction unless you gave your spouse a general power of appointment or had the property paid to her estate. Uh, when she died, and I'm going to refer to the surviving spouse as her because that's I'm a man and that's my perspective. My wife's going to survive me. Um, and a lot of people didn't like that, especially in second marriage scenarios. They wanted to control where those assets went at their death. So beginning in 1982, the Q-tip provisions were, uh, were inserted in, and some uh, other related provisions were put into the Internal Revenue Code. And... Um, Q-tip properties, property that passes from a decedent to the surviving spouse. She has a qualified income interest for life, and an election is made. So making that election triggers some other sections uh, application during her life and at her death. For instance, at the death of the surviving spouse, if that election was made, that property is included in her estate. So the husband and wife are treated as a unit. The estate tax is deferred until the surviving spouse dies. If she gives away or, or does, makes any disposition of her qualified income interest during life from the Q-tip trust, it triggers a deemed transfer of the remainder interest under 2519. Why is that necessary? To preserve the integrity of the transfer tax system. Let's say they terminate the marital trust. She gets the income interest, the, the, the uh, actuarial value. That replaces, theoretically, the income she would have received the rest of her life but the remainder interest goes to the remainderman. If that's gonna escape tax unless you tax it at that point in time. Um, the other provisions are, uh, that were added uh, with section 2207 capital A, which says if you make a Q-tip election and you have a deemed gift under 2515 or an inclusion in the surviving spouse's estate at her death, that um, uh, uh, she has the right to recover the increase in gift tax or estate tax that's attributable to that property because you don't want to bankrupt her estate because of the inclusion of these assets. Um, and then finally, I'm going to get into a very, the last scenario, a little bit of play on how you compute the estate tax. That is, you take somebody's taxable estate, you add their lifetime, their adjusted taxable gifts, and you compute a tentative tax, and then you, you do some more computations. But if you have a gift that is also included in the gross estate. You don't want to double count. And so you can make a gift during your life that's a gift for gift tax purposes and also retain certain interests that, were, that cause it to be included in your estate. So if that occurs in that computation, the, the prior gifts are excluded to avoid double counting. So I'm gonna move into my, uh, my scenario now. Um, whoops. This is Moneybag Smith. Now, any similarity between him and J. Howard Marshall is coincidental. And uh, J. Howard Marshall is often described as a Texas oil tycoon. I think a lot of people think of him as a crusty wildcatter. Nothing could be further from the truth. He was a Yale Law School graduate. He was Assistant Solicitor General of the Department of the Interior. He was Special Counsel to the President of Standard Oil of California, now Chevron. and. Uh, he was a partner in what was Pillsbury Madison. It's now uh, Pillsbury Winthrop, uh, one of the major law firms in the United States. He was a very shrewd businessman. Some of his decisions were open to question, though, however. And I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change the scenario a little bit to bring it into the present. Let's assume that in 1992, when he was 89 years old, money married a woman named Vanna Nicole, who was 20, at 26, was 63 years younger than him. And here we see the happy couple. He's not foaming at the mouth, I'm told. That's, birth, that's, uh, that's wedding cake on his, uh, on his chin. So they were married in 2012. Shortly after their marriage, this year in 2014, unfortunately, money died. Vanna was very, very sad about that, but she became the beneficiary of a $45 million uh, uh, Q-tip trust that was established for her. 
And of course, I mentioned that part of that is that she had a qualifying income interest for life. So she had to receive all the income that was generated by this $45 million uh, fund of investments for the rest of her life. And the remainder interest, of course, at her death will go to Mr. Smith's children. But the problem is they're all at least 30 years older than her. So they're, they're, not, likely to, uh, they're not likely to survive her. Now, another misconception about uh, the J. Howard Marshall is that uh, people think that, that he cut his children out of his estate plan when he married Vanna. That wasn't true. He actually owned 16% of Coke Industries, which is one of the largest public, privately held companies in the, in the United States run by the Koch brothers. And he and some other mi minority shareholders tried to take over control from the Koch brothers. And they would have been successful, except his two children sided with the Koch brothers. And he then wrote them out of his will. So that was before Vanna came along. But you can see when Vanna found out she had this life income interest in the $45 million <laughs> Q-tip trust, she was a very happy woman. The Smith children, not so much. <laughs> of course, that's Walt Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon, two of my favorite actors. Some of the younger people in the audience may not know them unless they watch TV late at night. So immediately after Money's death, uh, disagreements be be ensued between Vanna and the, the Smith children about everything having to do with the Q-tip trust, because anything that she took meant there was less that was go to them, even though probably really it meant go to their children because they were not going to survive Vanna. Luckily, they had a wise trustee. <laughs> uh, again, any similarities are completely coincidental. Why was he so wise? Well, he, of course, engaged Dean Mead to terminate the Q to find a, a to find a, a solution to this and we suggested that they terminate the Q-tip trust under uh, Florida trust code some you know Brian spoke to some of those methods in this case we used a non-judicial modification which required the consent of all the qualified beneficiaries those were the current income beneficiary Vanna and the people who would take if her interest terminated currently today and that's the Smith children so what happens you split the marital trust this way uh, based on actuarial factors and uh, based on uh, Vanna's now 28 years older in 2014. Her share of the marital trust of the $45 million would be approximately 65%, actually just a little bit less than that. And uh, Money's children, the Smith children, would receive about 35% when the trust was severed. Now, Vanna, of course, has no assets of her own other than those she wakes up with every morning. And uh, <laughs> she's, she's never made any taxable gifts, so she has the point of all, the point of that, I, I can't, why are you laughing? The point of that was because she has all of her applicable exclusion amount, her estate tax exemption remaining. But money, unfortunately, used all of his exemption making gifts before his death, and therefore none of his estate tax exemption was portable to, to, Van, to, uh, to Vanna. So now we're gonna look at what are the estate gift and, uh, and uh, income tax consequences of the trust severance. Okay, as I said, Vanna receives about 65% of the $45 million, about $29 million. And remember I mentioned section 2519, uh, or I mentioned the concept anyway, that if you make a disposition of a qualifying income interest, even if you take it for yourself, that's a disposition, that triggers under 2519 a deemed transfer of the remainder interest. So she makes a deemed transfer of the rem remainder interest to the Smith children, which is worth about $16 million. That's the actuarial value of the remainder interest. Um, now the 2519 gift, remember under 2207 capital A, she has the right to recover any estate tax, increase the amount of gift tax that's paid in the year she makes a 2519 deemed gift, she has the right to recover that from the people who receive the property, in this, in this case, the Smith children. So it's a net gift. What does that mean? That means that in addition to, when computing the gift tax, of course she gets the benefit of her uh, gift tax e exemption amount, and she, you also have to take the amount of the gift tax and you deduct that from the amount of the gift. So you get into the circular calculation and the gift becomes smaller and smaller. And the gift tax ends up being about $3 million, uh, whereas 40% of, uh, of $15 million would be significantly more than that. With, but her exemption plus the net gift concept brings the gift down to only $3 million. Now, what are the estate tax consequences? Of course, in making that gift, she used her lifetime exemption, so it won't be available to offset gifts at her death. 
And uh, remember that that $3 million of gift tax reduced the amount of the gift. Well, the, you know, the IRS, you know, we have a unified state and gift tax uh, regimen and regimen. And um, you don't want to, uh, or I guess regimes the right work, and, and you don't want anything to escape taxation. Well, that $3 million of gift tax would never be taxed, but for Section 2035B, which says that if you make a transfer within three years of death, and uh, then the gift tax you pay within that three, the gift tax you pay on gifts made within that three years prior to your death are brought back into your gross estate, and that's the uh, Morgan's case. So if you do this, you may want to make uh, some sort of accommodation or plan for that uh, tax, so maybe a three-year term life insurance policy or some sort of indemnification from the, uh, from the, from the remainderman, uh, which with a 28-year-old might not have been a problem, but the Smith children may have taken into account Vanna's lifestyle. Okay, what about the income tax consequences? In taking the uh, qualified in the, the amount, the, uh, it was about $29 million, in exchange for her qualified income interest, Van is treating, treated as having received that amount in exchange for the sale of her interest in the Q-tip trust. So that's an amount received. That's a, the McAllister case. But she has no basis in that. So in computing her gain, it's $29 million of amount received, zero basis. The whole thing is gain. Uh, and that's a, treated as a capital gain. Uh, again, there are a couple of authorities for that. And because uh, money died in 2012, this event occurred in 2014, it's a long-term capital gain. And because she is treated as essentially having purchased these assets, she takes a uh, fair market value basis uh, in, in the assets for income tax purposes if she then turns around and sells them. Um, the Q-tip trust uh, doesn't recognize any gain from the termination unless some of the issues come up that Brian talked about if appreciated assets are used, unless you have the ability under state law or the document to use uh, uh, pick and choose funding. What are the income tax consequences to the Smith children? Um, you know, not, not good. Uh, the, the income tax recognized by the trust, if any, is allocated to it's a capital gain it's a tax a capital gain tax so it's allocated to the remainderman and so it comes out of their share of the uh, trust and the assets they receive they just receive a carryover basis in it in those assets how would the tax consequences uh, change if Vanna received less than the 7520 amount in, in other words you know we have this actuarial computation she's supposed to receive 29 million dollars what if she said uh, for some reason I'll take less well the 20, 20 uh, 519 gift is still the same she's disposed of her qualified income interest it triggers a gift of the remainder interest but she also makes a gift under 2511 which is the general gift tax statute and that's the difference between the seven, the the actuarial amount the 29 million and what she actually receives would be a gift from her to the uh, smith children and you can she could use her fourteen thousand dollar annual exclusion to offset part of that although it wouldn't help much uh, which you can't use on the, uh, to offset any part of the tr gift that's triggered under 2519. Uh, the other scenario, what would happen if the children agreed for some reason to take less than the amount that they were entitled to, the 16 million, the 29, 2519 deemed gift is still the same, and the children would make a gift uh, equal to the $16 million actuarial value of their interest, less what they received. What if you wanted to sever the uh, Q-tip trust first uh, to minimize the tax implications because you're only going to do this to, as to part of the trust, and this actually goes into my last scenario, the next one too. There's no effect if you sever the, the Q-tip trust into two trusts and then you terminate or do something with one, there's absolutely no effect on, on the other trust that you severed, which is, I, I guess, is what you would assume would happen. And this is uh, my final scenario, and I actually did this uh, a couple years ago for a different reason, and it's sort of a neat play on a couple of things. Um, I'm going to change the, the scenario a little bit. Assume that money never uh, used any of his estate tax exemption. He had his entire applicable exclusion amount available at his death, $5,120,000 in 2012. Leaves all of his assets to a marital trust with, uh, for Vanna. He hopes she'll disclaim an amount equal to his exemption, which would pass to his children at his death. Um, but for some reason, uh, Vanna, who's the trustee, makes the Q-tip election, so she, but she doesn't disclaim anything. She keeps everything in the Q-tip trust. 
and estate tax returns filed for money and the portability election is made. So his applicable exclusion amount becomes Vanna's deceased spouse's unused exemption. Um, and uh, she now has that plus her basic exclusion amount. So she has about $10 million of exclusion to play with. Okay. She then marries Money's older brother, <laughs> e even Richard Smith, who has an even larger estate, but has used all of his exemption. Evan collapses of exhaustion on the honeymoon and is given only days to live. While Evan's on his deathbed, Vanna and, and, and Money's children realize that if Evan dies, he becomes Vanna's last deceased spouse, and she loses the applicable exclusion amount, the DSU amount of money. So they come to us, and we come up with a, a, a solution. We take the $45 million marital trust, we sever it into two trusts, marital trust one with about 30 million, marital trust two with about 15 million. And, and Vanna really doesn't want to give up much. She doesn't want to terminate the trust, so she disclaims 1% of the income interest. That's all she has to do to trigger 2519. She's triggered, she's deemed as having made a gift of the entire remainder interest. And so her, her 1% uh, income interest is worth about 97,000. The 2519 gift is worth uh, 5,243. So her total gifts are 5,340, which of course, of course is a glaring error in my materials. It should, remember she's trying to use money's DSU amount. He died in 2012, so it's only $5,120,000. But she retains the 99% income interest in marital trust too for the rest of her life. She doesn't give up very much. Now, what happens when you make a transfer and you retain something? Usually it's brought back into your estate. That's true. The 99% uh, of, of the value of marital trust two is brought back into her estate. All of marital trust one, of course, is in her estate. Um, remember her, that 2519 gift, it would be double counted if it weren't then backed out of the computation of her estate tax. But uh, she still, because she used it before Evan died, because she used money's DSU amount before Evan died, she still has her exemption amount plus uh, uh, money's DSU amount to offset the estate tax. And this planning is going to save approximately $2 million of estate tax over uh, if she had done nothing. And of course, her estate has the ability to recover the estate taxes that are attributable to marital trust two under... Uh, uh, that was included under 2036, and also to, to recover the uh, estate taxes due to marital trust one under uh, 2207A, which I mentioned at the outset. The planning that we're talking about here doing with terminating the Q-tip trust is not something that you can do immediately um, after money dies. You know, if you do this immediately after money dies, then you run the risk of losing that sure. marital deduction to begin with. This planning really works for an old and cold Q-tip. So we had already uh, established the Q-tip trust. We'd filed the tax return, gotten clearance from the IRS, and then without ever having pre thought that we were going to do this. There was no pre-planning. Um, then we look at <clears throat> terminating this Q-tip trust, because if you do it from the beginning without it being an old and co cold Q-tip, the IRS is going to disallow the marital deduction to begin with, and the whole thing falls apart. And the second question, or the second point, David, is why would Vanna go along with any of this? Okay. Well, you know, she, she would otherwise be the beneficiary of a $45 million Q-tip. Tell us the reasons why well, under the first she four, would say, under okay, the, I'll take $29 million. Under the first four scenarios, she's the beneficiary of the full trust, but all she's getting is an income interest. She's not entitled to anything other than the income from the trust, and money sons are cons constantly challenging the accountings and the investment strategy, which is they think is producing too much income for her and too little appreciation is going to eventually go to them or their children. And she can take $29 million and do with it as she pleases. Otherwise, she's going to be constantly battling with them or their children right. over the investments of that trust. Correct. Okay. All right. Matt. Uh, Jay is a wealthy businessman. He divorced his first wife and, for obvious reasons, married Gloria. <laughs> for Gloria, it was love at first sight when she saw Jay's personal financial statement. So they are a happy married couple. Now, Jay has a daughter from a prior marriage named Claire. Uh, Gloria has a son from her prior marriage named Manny. Uh, 
Now, Jay and Gloria have a daughter together named Chloe. Unfortunately and sadly, Jay dies, but I can tell you that he died a very happy man. <laughs> he is survived by Gloria and all the children. Now, Jay wrote his own irrevocable trust. He may have gone to legal Zoom to do that and stated that half of his adjusted gross estate would pass to a marital trust for Gloria and the other half of his adjusted gross estate would pass in equal shares to all children, including Gloria's son, Manny, outright. The marital trust for Gloria provides that she shall receive all the income from the marital trust, at least annually, but there is no right for the trustee to invade the principal of the marital trust for the benefit of Gloria. Upon Gloria's death, the marital trust will pass in equal shares to all of the children, including Manny, who's Gloria's son. Now, not everything was happy, happy for Jay and Gloria during their marriage. They separated for a period of time. They entered into a uh, marital settlement agreement during that separation. Um, they did not waive any marital rights. Uh, Jay did not want to get divorced during this period of time. He was very happy with that arrangement, but they later reconciled. Now, after Jay's death, his daughter Claire from his first marriage claimed that Jay's trust should be set aside and no part of Jay's estate should pass to Gloria due to the fact that there was a pre-existing marital settlement agreement. Jay's estate, including Chloe and Manny, settle with Claire by buying out Claire's interest in the marital trust and paying out her share of the residue of the trust early. There were other options that we, a state could have explored to reach a settlement. Brian talked about severance of trusts. That could have been an option in this case, uh, isolating Claire's interest in the marital trust in a, in a separate marital trust. Um, perhaps we could have terminated the Q-tip trust with respect to the Claire's portion. There would have been some adverse tax consequences there. But these folks really wanted to divide and go their separate ways. So Claire was bought out of all her interests in Jay's estate. So since we know that there are payments in satisfaction of a will or trust claim, we need to review the general rules regarding the characterization of that payment and whether that payment would be subject to income tax. And there's really three elements that we're going to look at generally to determine the character. The first is the nature of the transfer, on the interest of the claimant. If the claimant's interest is that of a beneficiary or an heir at law, then that has a character of an inheritance or a gift and is not subject to income tax. If the dispute, say, involved the level of compensation for serving as a fiduciary in Jay's estate, then the settlement payment would take the character of compensation would be subject to income tax. The next thing is, is it an enforceable right under state law? And then, is it a bona fide dispute? So if you have the dispute concerning a inheritance or gift, it concerns an enforceable right under state law, and it is a real dispute, a bona fide dispute, then generally speaking, it will not be subject to income tax on the payments. Now, it's very important when we construct these settlement agreements that we keep these general rules in mind, and when we're developing our recital clauses in the beginning of our settlement agreements, we want to cover each one of those elements to make sure that it is substantiated um, so that when we go report this to the IRS that our characterization will be uh, respected. Now, with respect to settlement agreements, um, the settlement agreement is not going to be binding on the IRS. Um, neither is a lower court decision going to be binding on the IRS. However, we think it's helpful in substantiating the character of the settlement payments in a will and trust contest to have a court order them. 
It also gives us an opportunity to have the court rule on very favorable factors to how we want this to be characterized. Um, so let's get into the first part of the uh, interest that Claire has in this estate. And she is a remainder beneficiary in the marital trust. Remember, one half of Jay's estate is going into a marital trust, which provides for all income to Claire for life. And then upon Claire's death, it gets equally divided between the children. So Claire has a one third remainder interest in that Q-tip trust. Now, fortunately, because Jay prepared his own trust, he failed to include a spendthrift clause in the trust that would restrict the ability of Claire to assign her interest in that trust. So because the spendthrift clause is not there, she can freely assign her interest. And so she's going to enter into a transaction with Chloe and Manny, the other two children, in which she sells her interest in the remainder trust and Chloe and Manny will use the money that they receive from the remainder to purchase her interest in the remainder trust and then she will be out of the remainder. So obviously in determining the value um, that they're willing to pay for Claire's remainder interest in the marital trust, they're going to consider Gloria's age, the likely rate of return on the assets in the marital trust over Gloria's life expectancy. And most importantly, uh, Jay's estate was very large and this marital trust is also very large and it's going to be subject to estate taxes upon Gloria's death. So in determining the amount that Chloe and Manny are willing to pay for uh, Claire's remainder interest in the marital trust, they have to take into account that one day they're going to have to pay the IRS estate taxes on Gloria's death. So in addition, we also want to think about the other interest if somebody had, dies before Gloria, there could be an out of order death. So if Manny or Chloe were to die before Gloria, what would happen to their remainder interest in the marital trust? That could potentially pass back to Claire and Claire's descendants. So not only do we want to purchase Claire's interest in the remainder trust, we also want to reform the marital trust so that in the event that somebody dies out of order, that that interest doesn't go back to Claire. So what are the income tax considerations uh, with the sale of the remainder interest? Um, this is clearly is a taxable uh, event. Um, Claire is selling an interest in the trust. It is going to be a capital uh, transaction, probably a short uh, term capital transaction. And to determine the gain or loss on that transaction, number one, we have determined what factors that we need to take into account to determine what Chloe and Manny are willing to pay um, for this interest, and that will be the amount received um, by Claire and what is her basis in her interest in the trust. The marital trust recently received a step up in basis for all its assets on Jay's death. And that basis is then going to be divided between Gloria, the life tenant in the marital trust and the remainder beneficiaries based on um, factors included in treasury regulation 20.2031-7. A couple of important points with respect to the determining the amount of gain or loss on this transaction uh, is that one, interest rates are very low, which drives down the, the value of Gloria's interest. Uh, but more importantly, um, we have to take into account that there's going to be estate taxes to pay one day. So the amount that Chloe and Manny are willing to pay are going to be less um, than what it's worth currently, which means that the amount received is probably going to be more modest than what we think it would otherwise be. It may even be lower than the amount of the basis that is assigned to, to Claire's interest. However, if there's any capital loss that would result to Claire from this transaction, that's likely not going to be usable by Claire because it is a related party transaction. There are limitations on hers being able to use those kind of losses. Now, with respect to the basis that Chloe and Manny now have in Claire's interest that they purchased is obviously set at the amount that they paid for it, but it really doesn't matter to them because they have no intention of selling uh, their interests in the Q-tip trust before Gloria's death, and upon Gloria's death, the assets will be included in her estate for tax purposes, and we will get another step up in basis at that time. <coughs> 
Now, with respect to potential gift tax conse uh, consequences, we have really two tests. Um, is there a shift of economic value between the beneficiaries? And I think in any kind of litigation or settlement, uh, you could probably find some shift of economic value between the, the beneficiaries. So more importantly, is there a quid pro quo? Does each um, interested party receive full and adequate consideration for the rights that they're giving up? And we think here that there was a uh, strong negotiations between competing interests, which leads us to conclude that there was a transfer between for full and adequate consideration between the parties and no gift results. Um, with respect to estate tax considerations, the purchase of the remainder interest in the marital trust um, preserves the marital deduction. It does not affect Gloria's interest at all. She still has all income for life in the entire marital trust. The remainder beneficiaries have changed, but it doesn't affect her. We preserve the marital deduction. And then lastly, are there any generation skipping transfer tax consequences here? This is a sale between children. It doesn't affect grandchildren or more remote descendants, and so we have no effect on uh, for generation skipping transfer tax purposes. Now, moving on to the second part of Claire's interest in Jay's estate, um, we have her interest in the other half of his estate that went outright to the three children equally. So she has a one-third interest, but um, she doesn't want to um, be a part of the administration. Uh, Jay's estate is large. It's going to take uh, quite a long time to administer it. and. Um, she doesn't want to be a party to that, and the other interested folks, Chloe, Manning, Glory, they don't want her around either. So um, we're just going to pay out her interest uh, a little earlier than we otherwise would. So when we do that, we have to keep in mind that when we make a payment from the residue um, to Claire in full satisfaction of her interest in the residue, now we're shifting the risks of a audit of the estate, um, discovery of other assets, um, discovery of prior gifts that we were unaware of, all of those risks shift to um, the people, Manny, uh, Chloe, and uh, Gloria. So in our settlement agreement, we want to make sure that we covered and have attestations that nobody knows of other assets, other gifts, or other things that may affect down the road. So because Claire is receiving a payment in full for her interest in the, in the beneficiary, we don't need to reform the trust, although we may want to, uh, to clean up certain incidental issues such as allocation of taxes and expenses. So what are the income tax considerations for paying out of, out of the residue? Well, first of all, this is clearly an inheritance, so there's no income taxes. Um, the distribution from the residue will carry out the income tax that are generated within the residue to Claire. That is uh, income tax rules that we cannot negotiate or change. The um, settlement payment from the residue is not a, going to be considered a satisfaction of a pecuniary interest. It's a residuary gift. So any in-kind distribution would not generate gain or loss to the trust on satisfaction of this interest, although we're pretty sure that she's going to insist on cash payment out of the residue. What are the gift tax considerations for this arrangement? Again, based on the, the standards that I previously went over, um, even though Claire may be receiving a little less to account for shift in risk to the other beneficiaries, um, we still feel that this was a negotiated deal and so it's for full and adequate consideration of exchange of interests and there should be no gift tax consequences. With estate tax considerations, uh, again, we wanna pay attention to tax apportionment all the taxes uh, attributable to, to the assets under the trust will be paid out of the residue. That's going to affect how much Claire receives. Uh, oftentimes, the taxes on assets outside of the trust are paid out of the residue of the trust. So we just have to be mindful of who's paying taxes when considering how much we're going to pay out Claire. Also, administrative expenses are going to get paid out of the residue of the trust, so we need to make estimates and deduct for those when determining the amount that Claire will receive in full satisfaction of her interest. And importantly, we want to be able to deduct the administrative expenses for tax purposes. Half of Jay's estate is going to be marital deduction. The other half is subject to estate tax, and we want to get a deduction for the administration expenses that we pay. So 
uh, the standard for the deduction of the administration expenses are whether they're bona fide and allowable under local law, and that whether and we can only deduct those expenses that were actually actually necessarily incurred in the administration of the decedent's um, estate. Um, with respect to attorneys' fees, the IRS applies a reasonableness standard, and that is the general standard under Florida law as well um, for the deductibility of fees. Under Florida law, we look at whether fees are for ordinary services or extraordinary services. With respect to ordinary services provided to the trust, if we uh, we have a statutory rate schedule that's tied to the size of the estate, if the fees fall within that schedule, there's a presumption that they are reasonable for extraordinary services, which services in relation to a trust contest would be considered extraordinary. It's a facts and circumstances test in Florida. We look at the size and complexity of the trust, the responsibilities and liabilities of the attorney, the benefits or detriments to the trust and its beneficiaries to determine whether it's a reasonable fee. So we want to be able to deduct the fees for the attorneys for the trust against um, the taxes. And with respect to the uh, lawyers who are clearly going to be representing all the other beneficiaries of the trust, the question is whether or not any of those services that were provided could be considered a benefit to the trust and therefore deductible. Obviously, they would have to be paid from the trust to be deductible, and they would have to be in relation to those uh, actually or necessarily incurred in the administration of the trust, but arguably some of those uh, fees paid to the other beneficiaries are related to finding the, the proper distribution of the trust, but that's a fine line there, and that's a negotiated point. If you do pay out fees to beneficiaries, attorneys, then you want an agreement to be able to substantiate the fees that were paid out to them. Uh, generation skipping transfer tax consequences, there are none. Again, this is dealing only with children's interests. Um, a couple of other issues. I think I've sort of run over my time already as Lauren's giving me the evil eye here. There were a couple of issues that were kind of buried in the, in the fact pattern. Uh, uh, one is elective share. Marital settlement agreement, but we didn't have a waiver of marital rights. Elective share is 30% of the elective estate. Half of Jay's estate went into a marital trust that provides for all income. That kind of trust only counts against the elective estate at 50%. So you've got 50% of 50%, which is less than 30%. So Gloria probably has a good uh, way to get a little more money by making an elective share election. And if she does, uh, that'll increase the marital deduction and no income would flow out to uh, Gloria on that payment. And then lastly, Jay divided his estate. Half adjusted gross estate went to marital trust. Half adjusted gross estate went to the children. It doesn't have a true residuary clause. In fact, the way adjusted gross estate is defined, it probably would distribute more money than the trust has to give out. So we want to have a trust construction action to make sure that the residuary amount passes to the three children. And so that will clarify where tax gets paid from, where administration expenses get paid from. And by that settlement, we have effectively gotten Claire out of Jay's estate and that the other beneficiaries can go along their merry way. Previously today, we've talked about using um, severances, modifications, terminations, purchases of interest. Um, um, when we've got a dispute, we had a potential dispute that was that could be brewing down the road between uh, Carlton and um, uh, Will, thank you. Uh, we clearly have the big dispute between um, the surviving spouse and the and the older children. Uh, and here we had a dispute among the beneficiaries. Uh, and so in the one that Matt just did, and we solved all of those problems uh, by taking these actions with either uh, absolutely no tax consequences or uh, limited tax consequences that we were able to quantify and uh, determine. The last uh, sort of method that we use to solve trust problems uh, or estate problems is um, not necessarily one that is used when we have big conflicts, and it's decanting. Uh, 
All right. Um, and this is, um, a, a, you know, when I when I talk to my clients about the possibility of decanting, they ask, you know, where when am I bringing out the wine? Uh, and in fact, that is what the term came from. The the concept of decanting is where you take uh, the assets of an old trust, you create a new trust, and you put them into the new trust. And so it's like taking the wine out of the bottle and putting it in the decanter. Uh, and it is a relatively new concept, uh, a new statutory concept that we're gonna, we're gonna visit. But first, let's go over um, the facts. Okay, and this is based on uh, parenthood, which is that uh, show about uh, a family and with multiple children. And here we're focusing on Camille, who is the grandmother. And she created a Florida Irrevocable Trust in 2002. And it provides for distributions to or for the benefit of one of her daughters, Sarah, and Sarah's children for their health, education, maintenance, and support. In addition, the trust has a special provision that says a disinterested trustee can make distribution for or um, the descendants in their best interests. That's important, we'll see in a moment. Um, the, you know, I'm gonna let you, will you do this? Thank you. Um, the trust provides that one third of the assets are gonna go outright to Sarah when she reaches 35, and then another third at 40, and the rest at, at uh, 45. But if she were to die before the trust was terminated, it would go to her children outright. And Sarah has two adult descendants, Amber and Drew. Um, Camille did not allocate any generation skipping exemption to this trust. And as we know, um, there would be no automatic allocation of exemption to this trust because it wasn't a GST trust, because it provided for distributions to be distributed during um, the probable lifetime of, of the first generation, Sarah. Uh, and so let's hope that the trustee hasn't made any distributions to or for the benefit of Amber and Drew, who are grandchildren, that weren't directly to an educational institution or a medical provider, because otherwise they had made a taxable distribution and there would have been generation skipping uh, tax due. But we hope that didn't happen. So now what's happened is that the trust assets have grown um, larger than Camille really anticipated. Her, ch her daughter and her grandchildren have not exactly turned out the way she thought. If any of you all watch this, the show, Sarah is kind of a screw up, been married a number of times. There's always a, a boyfriend floating around and uh, the grandchildren have alcohol and drug problems. And uh, Camille is very concerned that there's gonna be a lot of money that's gonna go outright to either Sarah or to the children, the grandchildren. And uh, she now understands that she wishes that she had left these assets in trust because she knows the great benefits of trust, that it protects against creditors, it protects against the beneficiary themselves using the assets in, imprudently, it uh, protects against uh, divorce settlements, etc. And she is also very concerned that um, Amber and uh, Sarah and Drew might not make anything out of their lives if they get all of this money outright. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so I'm sorry. Uh, and so now the question uh, is, what can be done to save this Braverman family? And if we stop for a moment and think about some of the other methodologies that we've talked about today, they don't necessarily work well here. We're not talking about selling an interest, that won't work. We're not talking about severing trusts up, that's not gonna work. Really, not even a modification is gonna work because a modification would require beneficiary consent for the most part or a protracted fight uh, about it because they were entitled to get these assets at a certain age or outright and, and now somebody wants to hold the, the assets and trust longer, so a modification may not work. In addition, a modification might have some unwarranted uh, um, gift tax consequences because it would require beneficiary consent, and we might end up with the if we if we hold these assets and trust longer, Sarah was supposed to get them at a certain age. If she doesn't get them and it goes down to the next generation, maybe she's made a gift when she consented to that 
modification. So that doesn't really work so well. So now we go to something that really will work and something that we've done a zillion times, and that is to decant. And we are going to then have the trustee who needs to be a disinterested trustee who is going to then create a new trust. And we're simply going to take the assets of the old trust and we're going to move them over to the terms of the new trust. And presumably this new trust then would provide that the, it, the trust will continue for the benefit of Sarah and the children for uh, and her children for generations and descendants to come. And we would also then allocate generation skipping exemption to this trust. Camille's got a five plus million dollar generation skipping exemption. She hadn't used any of it. So now we go ahead and allocate generation skipping exemption based upon the value of the assets in the trust at this time to this trust. And we're good to go. We can continue on for generations and be protected against all of these things. And that works if we can do it. Well, what are the requirements to do it? First of all, we have to either um, have the authority under the trust document or under state law to do this decanting, to do this transferring of assets from one trust to the other. And fortunately, Florida happens to be uh, the first state that uh, provided for common law decanting way back in 1940, uh, where they allowed, uh, the Supreme Court allowed this to happen. And uh, for many, many, many years, floor was the only state in the country that had common law decanting. And then in the last 10 years or so, a lot of the states have uh, enacted statutes that allow for decanting. And Florida has a decanting statute. Uh, don't go trying to look up decanting. Uh, we all refer to it as a decanting statute, but you won't find that in the, in the research. It's trustees' power to invade principle and trust is what that uh, actually is. And there are certain requirements under the statute. Um, and the, the biggest requirement, sometimes the one that's the hardest to meet, is that in Florida, we drafted our statute. It became effective January 1st, 2007. And it requires that the trustee must have absolute power to invade principal. That just means that it can't be limited to an ascertainable standard. So if they only have the power to uh, distribute principal for health, education, maintenance, and support, that won't qualify. If they have the power for any other broader term, like here it said best interest, or it could say comfort or happiness or welfare, that is set, thought to be and described as an absolute power and will qualify uh, for the decanting statute. Um, you can always have a decanting power in the trust okay, that allows this, even if the statute doesn't, and most of our trusts do have decanting powers. Um, the, the new trust can change the provisions for the beneficiary any way you want to. Can extend it, reduce it, you can eliminate beneficiaries, but you cannot add beneficiaries. That's the only requirement about the changing the disposition is that you can't add a beneficiary. And if a beneficiary has a fixed right, like if we had had a provision in this trust that said all income must be payable to Sarah, we can't change that in the new trust. That has to carry over. So if there's a fixed income right or annuity right, that must remain in the new trust. And how you actually do it is that the trustee notifies the qualified beneficiaries and gives them um, 60 days notice before we exercise it. This is private, okay? This does not require beneficiary consent. This does not require court order. This is why this works so much better in this circumstance than a modification does, because we're not asking the beneficiaries to consent. We're not asking the court to order it. It's simply private. The trustee creates the new trust, sends out a notice, and says, I'm going to decant from one trust into the new trust, and I'm going to do it in 60 days. No news from the beneficiaries. Good news. The trustee does it. What if the what if one of the, um, I say from the trustees, uh, beneficiaries, what if one of the beneficiaries objects? Okay. There's um, no real procedure in the statute for what you do if somebody objects. And at that point in time, the trustee's got to make a decision. They can go ahead and do it and risk having the beneficiary sue them for a breach of fiduciary duty. They can go to court and ask for a court order, 
to approve it or they can abandon the idea, any of those. And it all depends upon the circumstances. If you've got a disinterested trustee, and you should always have a disinterested trustee doing this, if you've got a disinterested trustee and you've got good reasons, they may go ahead and do it anyway. If you've got an alcoholic or a, a drug addicted beneficiary and you don't want the assets to go out right, um, so what if they object? You know, it's, 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 we're not terribly concerned at that point in time with a breach of fiduciary duty uh, for doing this because we think it's in the beneficiary's best interest. So it all depends upon what exactly it is that you're changing in the trust and, and, and who's doing the objecting. I've had all three of those circumstances apply. We've gone ahead and done it. We've said, no, we're not going to do it, or we go to court and get a court order approving it. Um, this works very well, I might add, when we've got a trust and we then turn out with a turn up um, a beneficiary that has special needs, and we need to change this to be a special needs trust so that we avoid losing any eligibility for federal benefits. It's a wonderful way uh, to uh, uh, change a trust that wouldn't qualify into a trust that would qualify as a special needs trust. All right, and so uh, here we've determined that we can do it. We've got a power uh, to make distributions for best interests, and um, but let's suppose that it turned out that uh, we didn't have that power in this trust. Let's suppose we only had something that was limited to a distribution for an ascertainable standard. Well, there are about 22 states right now that have decanting statutes. About half of them have provisions that would allow a decanting to happen even where there is a distribution that is limited by an ascertainable standard. And so it is possible to actually change the situs to one of those states that does that. We've done this. We use Delaware most of the time. Delaware has a, a great decanting statute. And, uh, and then decant while you're in Delaware and then move it back later on. Uh, wait a little bit. Uh, you certainly don't want to change situs to a state where there's an income tax. So we wouldn't be uh, changing situs to New York uh, in order to do a decanting, but Delaware would wor work well. I will also tell you that we are uh, currently working on updating our statute. Uh, I'm on a committee that is working on uh, redrafting some portions of our decanting statute. And uh, we won't have it ready for the 2015 legislature, but we hope that we will in 2016. And one of the main things that we're changing is to uh, hopefully to provide for a broader decanting um, provision that is not limited to only if there's an absolute power. All right. What about the tax consequences? We've determined that we can do this under state law and it works well. What about the tax consequences? Well, in 2011, the IRS uh, uh, put out a notice and asked for comments on um, guidance that they were working on, on the tax consequences of decanting. They got way more than they ever thought they were gonna get, and um, uh, it kind of threw them for a loop. And they have uh, then decided that they needed to study the situation a little bit more. Uh, they took it off of the priority guidance um, uh, list, and they're still working on it. We just don't expect to see it any time in the very near future, but hopefully we will get some guidance from the IRS about what the tax consequences are on uh, decanting. And in the meantime, they will not issue private rulings on decanting. Should this deter us from doing decanting, right? Does this mean that we can't do it? Are we so concerned about the tax consequences tax consequences that we don't do decanting? And the answer to that is absolutely no. Um, we feel pretty comfortable about what most of the tax consequences are. So let's start with income tax issues. First of all, decanting should not really have an income tax consequence. Right? Um, it shouldn't because the concept is it's the same trust. Right. Well, the old trust becomes the new trust, and it didn't change anything. And basis and, and um, holding periods, everything uh, carries over. And that really should not be a, a tax event. Many times you don't even get a new tax ID number. You can use the old tax ID number or get a new one if you want to. Um, and there generally shouldn't be any realization event, no gain or loss realized by the beneficiaries unless we're having a change from a grantor trust to a non-grantor trust, okay, and you have 
these negative basis assets inside the trust, which are assets that have either debt in excess of basis, or it's a partnership or an LLC interest with a negative capital account. But even if you weren't doing decanting, if you're switching from grantor to non-grantor trust, you've got those same tax consequences. So the decanting in and of itself, when you do a switch from grantor to non-grantor, doesn't is not what triggers any tax consequence. It's the switch from grantor to non-grantor. Um, and if you switch from grantor, if you have a grantor trust to a grantor trust, even if you have these hot assets, there's not a problem because um, Revenue Ruling 8513 tells us that's just not even an event okay, if it's grantor to grantor. So we're not terribly worried about the income tax consequences. Okay, um, and but uh, if we are. Uh, we always have the fallback position of cottage savings, which says that unless we're making a material change in the interests of the beneficiary, we shouldn't have an income tax consequence. And we really shouldn't be having a material change. The reason why this really shouldn't apply is because it's not the beneficiary doing it. The concept behind cottage saving is that you've got a sale or exchange by a beneficiary of their interest. This has nothing to do with the beneficiary. This is a trustee, a disinterested trustee who has no interest in the trust and is does not require the consent of the beneficiary to do this transaction. So there really shouldn't be, except in those circumstances of switching from grantor to non-grantor and hot assets, any income tax consequences. Same thing with the gift tax. Okay, um, we, we really don't think there's any gift tax consequence because, again, the beneficiary is not doing it. In this circumstance, we've got Sarah is no longer going to get her assets outright when she turns 40 and 45. Okay? Instead, it's going to stay in trust and going to go down to her children. You might think that otherwise would look like a gift. Okay, that Sarah has made a gift because it's not it's not something that she's she would have otherwise had it. Okay, but now it's going to uh, her kids, but she's not the one doing it. Right, the trustee is the one that is doing it, and her interest. Okay, is the interest that she has in the trust Sarah's interest. She takes it subject to whatever the powers of the trustee are, whatever the powers under state law. So the trustee has the ability to do this decanting, and the fact that the trustee, in fact, decanted it should not mean that it's a gift by Sarah. She didn't have anything to do with it. That's why we don't have her consent to it. That's why our statute specifically does not require consent. Again, we are uh, also not concerned about estate tax consequences unless you're doing something in the new trust to add to that. If you were to add a general power of appointment in Sarah, then um, in the new trust, then sure, there would be estate tax consequences uh, when she died. But uh, if you're not doing something like that, there shouldn't be any estate tax consequences. Then let's come back to the last thing, which is the um, generation skipping uh, tax. And um, the first time around, we said that um, uh, Camille had not exercised, had not um, allocated any GST exemption. So the, when we uh, created the new trust, a long-term dynasty trust, we allocated GST exemption, no problem. But change it up just a little bit, and let's assume that it was a trust that was for Sarah's lifetime, originally a trust for Sarah's lifetime, and when Sarah dies, it went outright to the two deadbeat grandchildren. And Camille doesn't want it to go outright to the two deadbeat grandchildren. She wants it to, co to continue for their life. Can she do that without generation skipping uh, consequences? And the answer to that is yes, she should be able to do that. Even if she had not allocated generation skipping exemption to that trust, there would have been an automatic allocation because it, it is now a GST trust. So that is a tax, a GST exempt trust. And the question is, when we do this decanting, do we lose our exemption? Is it still going to have a zero inclusion ratio? And you have to look to the regulations. Uh, Brian quoted part of the regulations. I'm quoting the other part of the regulations. And basically, if you stay within the regs, there's a safe harbor. And if you, if you stay within that, you should have no generation skipping exemption problems. And those two requirements are, has to be done pursuant to either court authority or, or uh, authority in the trust, and two, 
that the second trust, the new trust, does not extend the time for vesting beyond what's known as the federal rule against perpetuities period. And that's the lives in being plus 21 years or 90 years. So Camille, not Camille, the two grandkids were alive when Camille created the trust, their lives in being. So we can do a trust that goes for the two grandchildren's lifetime and lasts for 21 years thereafter, and we should be able to preserve our generation skipping exemption and have a zero inclusion ratio for this trust. So decanting is a wonderful thing that we do a lot of when we want to change um, trusts up and don't want to be in a court process with uh, a modification. All right, so we have seen um, uh, that uh, there are a lot of different methods that we have available to us to resolve disputes, solve problems, uh, fix trusts, and uh, analyze briefly what those consequences are. Before we talk just a few minutes about the legislative update, uh, are there any questions? No questions at all? Nothing? Wow, okay. Um, so then let's look at three developments that happened in the legislature this spring. Um, uh, we were involved in drafting, working on all three of those. Um, and uh, the first one I'm going to talk about, then Brian's going to talk about the second one, and David's going to talk about the Maury versus Everbank fix. Uh, the first one has to do with co-trustees. And when you have co-trustees, what the liability is between those trustees. Let me just set up a scenario. You have a dad uh, uh, dies, leaves a trust, and in that trust there are portfolio assets, all kinds of other assets, and there's also an interest in the family business. And dad says, I'm going to have co-trustees, I'm going to have, let's say, bank as a trustee and they're going to manage all the portfolio interest etc and then i'm going to have a family member and i'm going to say that all the decisions relating to the family business are to be made by the family member and the other trustee is supposed to just go along whatever with whatever the family member says about the family business this is a scenario that is done frankly quite a lot um, and the, that works great, okay? Except for the bank says, wait a minute, um, I'm to be directed by this family member and as to what's gonna happen, and what if the family member screws up and steals money, runs the business into the ground? I don't wanna be liable for something that I have no right to control whatsoever. And, and so um, we, we go back to what our trust code said. When we brought the Uniform Trust Code in in 2007, we added a provision that's called the power to direct. And that's 736-0808. And this power direct says that, that if a trustee is to be directed, and it can be directed by another co-trustee or it can be directed by a trust advisor or a beneficiary, any, anybody, if there's a power to direct, then the trustee that's being directed is not liable unless the attempted exercise is manifestly contrary to the terms of the trust or the trustee knows the attempted exercise would constitute a breach of fiduciary duty. So there's, there's, they're, they're protected a little bit, but the trustee says, well, that's like being a little bit pregnant. Okay, this isn't going to help me at all because um, you know I'm going to. It says unless I, I, I know or, or should have known that there was a breach, uh, that requires me to check on what the family member is doing. I'm going to have to monitor and supervise and know everything that's going on over here, or I'm going to be held liable. So that doesn't help me at all. And so uh, two years after the trust code came in, we went back and we put in a new statute, 736.0703, and it deals strictly with actions and exculpation of liability between co-trustees. And unfortunately, we drafted it one way, and the legislature added um, some um, nice, a few little goodies in there that completely ruined the entire statute. And so we have been um, really looking at trying to fix it since then. What the legislature added was they said that unless the excluded trustee, that's the trustee, the corporate trustee that's not um, doing anything, um, uh, unless there was uh, misconduct 
on the part of the person that's doing the directing, the trustee that's doing directing, um, then uh, and the other trustee should have known about it, then they're exculpated. Well, that doesn't help at all. So they got it all confused, and we spent the last couple of years trying to fix it. Well, we fixed it. Okay, uh, the bankers and the real property probate and trust law section fought back and forth for a few years about these words. We finally have agreed upon, and in your materials you will see the revised section 736.0703, which says the excluded trustee, that's the corporate trustee in my example, is not liable for the actions of the other trustee. Okay, um, uh, they are only liable for their own willful, wanton, reckless misconduct. Okay, and there's no duty to monitor whatsoever. Uh, they don't have to supervise, and so we are uh, hopeful now um, that this will resolve some of the problems because, frankly, uh, corporate trustees were taking trust business and going to Delaware, which had a better statute, did exculpate uh, trustees under these circumstances. And so we're now hopeful that this will keep the trust business in Florida. Um, and it's particularly important right now, after 2013, because we have this new net investment income surtax of the 3.8% that can be avoided if there's material participation. And so if we have that circumstance of the family trustee who is materially participating, we now know as a result of the Frank Aragona case that came out in the tax court in March that we might be able to have this trust avoid that net investment income surtax. And so it's more important than ever to have a family trustee be able to participate as a trustee dealing with the family business. And this will allow us to have trustees work together in that regard and not be worried about liability. Okay, Brian. Um, my section is dealing with what has now become chapter 662, which is an entirely new chapter under four statutes. It was basically a project I was involved in starting probably five years ago and I've been working on it ever since with several other people around the state. But um, this, this chapter deals with authorizing the formation and operation of family trust companies in Florida. And there's at least 14 other states that have family trust company legislation. And uh, some you may have heard this term of private trust companies. Well, the concept is the same. Um, we've termed it family trust companies in Florida, but there are a handful of other states that have s similar legislation. Uh, but to give you an idea of what's in the statute in the, the minute or so I have left, uh, basically from a 30,000 foot level, a family trust company is defined as a corporation or LLC that's exclusively owned by family members, organized or qualified to do business in Florida, and that provides fiduciary services exclusively to uh, family members and up to 35 current and former employees of the family trust company or family businesses. So basically it's a, a similar operation to a public trust company. However, the scope of the services is extremely limited just to family members. And uh, just to give you an idea of who is defined in the term of a family member, basically have individuals that are within the sixth degree of lineal consanguinity or ninth degree of collateral kinship. Uh, to a person that you're going to nominate in your application, which is called a designated relative. Um, you have family entities that are owned or controlled more than 50% of the voting securities by family members. You have trusts as long as they are created and exclusively funded by family members, or if they're not created and exclusively funded by family members, then uh, they have to have all the beneficiaries being all the qualified beneficiaries being family members or charities in which a majority of the board are family members. Uh, charitable foundations and entities are also included within the definition of family members, uh, as long as the majority of the board is family members. Basically, the family trust companies can take one of there's three different types we talk about in the statute. One's a licensed family trust company, and this is somebody that applies to the Office of Financial Regulation to actually become licensed. Um, they have the greatest regulatory oversight of the three types, and they have some additional requirements above and beyond what the other uh, an unlicensed family trust company has. And that brings me into the second one, which is an unlicensed family trust company. That's somebody that's not going to, um, they want to provide fiduciary services to the family, but they don't want to be actively regulated. Their requirements are a little less, but at the same time, the scope of their services is slightly uh, 
slightly limited as well. Uh, we also authorize foreign licensed family trust companies. So these are the ones that may come from other states. Uh, they want to operate in Florida now. They may be licensed under Nevada, Delaware, uh, one of the handful of other states that authorize this. And they now come. Then now, now want to do business in Florida because they have family members here. And obviously, Florida is a little bit better place to go than Delaware uh, in the winter time. Um, so just to point out a couple other highlights. One, the effective date is October 1st, 2015. Uh, there was a reason for that delayed effective date. It is an entirely new chapter. It's complicated. It's going to take time to get up to speed. Um, and also, one of the reasons we delayed the effective date is because there are family trust companies operating in Florida right now. Uh, you may not be aware of them, but what they have done is basically gone to OFR and said, we want to operate as a family trust company in Florida, but we don't want to be subject to the same regulations as a public trust company. So therefore, can you give us an exemption? Um, they're few and far between. And uh, you know those existing trust companies will need to convert under 662. There won't be uh, any longer two tracks of regulation. You, know, you won't have the exemption letter route to go anymore. Um, Two other issues. One, the tax issues, of course, we wouldn't be talking about it if there weren't tax issues. But uh, th right now they're unsettled. The IRS came out with guidance back in 2008, and it was proposed guidance at the time. And uh, there were several comments received. We're still awaiting final guidance, but we expect it to come at any point. Um, SEC registration issues, family trust companies uh, have to register with the SEC if they are providing investment services or they have to qualify for an exemption. And there are a couple of exemptions to note for family trust companies. Lastly, just keep an eye out since this is effective October 1st, 2015, we are going to be trying to, um, pass some revisions to the act, uh, because some things did get tweaked in legislation or in the legislative process, uh, before it was passed that, you know, we weren't the happiest with. So, We'll just say we're not sending a Christmas card to OFR this year. Uh, but David, that'll do it for my section. David will talk about the last fix. Okay, any question? Any questions for Brian on the uh, family trust company legislation? Okay, the last thing I wanted to touch on, because there was sort of a potpourri of, of uh, estate and trust provisions that were passed as a, a separate bill. And uh, probably the most important in there, and with the time, I'll just talk about this one in the time I have remaining, is Chapter 222, which creates the exemptions from creditors' claims under Florida law. It says that if a decedent uh, dies, a resident of Florida leaves life insurance, the proceeds are exempt from the claims of his creditors unless the insurance is paid to his estate. And that's carried over into the probate code, which uh, acknowledges the death benefits, including uh, life insurance policies that are payable to a uh, trust created during life, whether revocable or irrevocable, or to a trust, directly to a trust created under a will, rather than being paid to the estate and passing through the estate to the trust, uh, are exempt from creditors' claims. Um, Mr. Morey, unfortunately, had a will drafted uh, by someone. Uh, well, actually, I don't know if it was the, the language or the, or the court. Um, uh, he died with some debts and also some insurance payable to his revocable trust. And his uh, trust contained a provision which basically paraphrases what the trust statute says that in terms of revocable trust responsibility for paying the estate's uh, liabilities, which is uh, that the trustee of a revocable trust shall pay to the personal representative any amounts the personal representative certifies in writing are required to pay the expenses of administration and obligations. And the court looked at that language, which is pretty standard. Uh, and, and most people had looked at the absolute exclusion if the assets weren't paid to the estate and said that language basically uh, evidenced an apparent intent to uh, include those in the estate or make them available, the insurance proceeds payable to revocable trust, available to pay estate obligations and uh, administration expenses. So the, the again, the Florida Bar Reptile Section drafted some revisions, which the legislature actually did enact uh, as they were drafted, which came back and said, we really meant what we said. So now, unless the trust agreement expressly refers to the section in the probate code, 733-808, and directs that it not apply, so you really have to intentionally opt out of this protection that the proceeds from the life insurance paid to the trust will not be subject to creditor's claims after the uh, insured's death. 
And that is that's uh, has retroactive effect. It, it applies to any trust whenever created and whenever the uh, insured died. to the uh, protection under Florida statutes from creditors' claims. Yes, they can reach uh, most any assets, in, including homestead. The is always an right. <laughs> Tennessee, by the entirety's properties, homestead, they can reach. They and I, there are probably other super creditors like the probably the SEC, FCC, that because uh, uh, there was a, uh, I can't remember, the people who were doing the promotional videos and selling basically nothing in a pyramid scheme and uh, their trust was reached or their property that was tendency by the tires was reached, I think, by the FCC. Right. Any other questions? Well, we appreciate you all coming. Oh, and please fill out um, the little evaluation Karen reminded me. And if you have any other topics, uh, let us know. Our next seminar is going to be October the 30th uh, here, and um, we will have some Halloween theme going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay.